to welcome everybody to the kickoff presentation to the 2019 Bristol Historical Society. Um, I don't know if any or all of you were here in the past when Mike was here, gave a presentation about what I always considered was a cannon, but found out instead it was a rifle. I have told more people the story about that black thing on our green. Uh, Mike's here to talk to us again about the Bristol soldiers from the uh, historical or the Civil War. So I expect it to be a very good presentation. Uh, Rick Desorda did have an entry in the newspaper. I think it was uh, Monday's newspaper, the Edison Independent. Talks about our schedule for the year. Uh, I welcome all of you to come back every year, every month to see the, our presentations. Uh, next month, I remember that we have something called Forgotten Farms, and it's Gil Coates from the uh, Moncton Historical Society is going to be talking about it. But there will be a posting in the newspaper every month telling what the subject is going to be. So without further ado, you know, I'll give it over to Mike to share with us some very interesting information, I'm sure. Thank you all very much. Thanks for coming down to, to listen to this bit of information that I put together. Um, <clears throat> I live here in Bristol, maybe many of you know that, on, on North Street, living at my wife Martha's family uh, farmhouse where her family has been living since 1870. So she has some real roots here in Bristol. And this was one of the reasons I like to do presentations about the town or just information you know, related to Bristol and the people of Bristol. Uh, one of the Bits of information I was given last fall is from the cemetery committee. I was given a list of names in an Excel uh, format, a spreadsheet type format, of veterans, Civil War veterans that are buried locally here in Bristol, primarily in, um, at Greenwood, also Varney and Briggs Hill Cemetery. And I was given a list that had over a hundred names on it, uh, and and these are, are veterans that that are buried here locally. And one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to go through that list and starting off with about a hundred or so names, and find out how many of the people buried here are really from Bristol. Some of the some of the people, some of the Civil War veterans that are are buried there. <coughs> are from Lincoln and New Haven, Starksboro, and Moncton. But to try to focus on this information, I wanted to stay with the Bristol veterans. Uh, when these, these young men uh, signed up to, to join the, the Vermont regiments, they were asked where their residence was, and that was part of how th these names I came up with. And so I have picked uh, the young men who listed their residence as Bristol, even though my wife Martha certainly has relatives that were in the Civil War, but back in the 1860s they were living in Orwell. So his name does not come up on my presentation, even though it's a family name and he was in the uh, 1st Vermont Volunteer Regiment as the war started. But that's kind of where this whole thing has come from. I spent most of the winter doing a lot of research. Uh, there's a lot of reference material that is that supports this time frame, this time in our, in our country's history. Uh, so it was just a matter of time to go through name by name by name. One of the bits of information, I have a, a reprint of a book that was printed in 1892 in, in Montpelier. There's about 34,000 names in this book of all of the, um, the young men who, who uh, I'll try to stay okay. Of all the young men that were, you know, that were fighting in the war, as they called it at that time, the War of the Rebellion. And uh, this is where I got a lot of my reference material in this book here. If anybody has, excuse me, anybody has a name of a relative they have and they're 
and not sure whether this relative may have been in the Civil War, this book would answer that question for you if you wanted to take a look perhaps after the presentation. Okay. Um, we could probably hit the lights, right? Yeah. This, this photograph that I put as a, as, a, uh, as a first slide is Bristol. And the slide states that this, this is, the date of this is about 1889. But uh, it's very interesting to look at the village of Bristol. And uh, I don't know if you're going to see my pointer, but this area in here is the, t is the park. This is North Street going up. And you can see basically what the town might you know, look like, even though it's a drawing, from the late 1880s. And uh, this picture also is at the back of the room. And that's where I got the picture. My first slide starts off with the, the Civil War, which started in uh, 1861 with the firing on, of Fort Sumter. After, after the firing on Fort Sumter in Charleston, South Carolina Harbor, there was the word did come to Vermont, and it was just a couple of days later at the, the surrender of Fort Sumter and President Lincoln's call for 75,000 troops to, to support the war. At that time, in 1861, the U.S. Army's standing uh, uh, soldiers, it was about 16,000 was, was the, uh, the, the, the army at that time. So it was really quite small. So President Lincoln knew to get this thing you know, going, he was going to need help from the individual states, the Union states at that time. And this is where Vermont was asked to, uh, uh, to support the war effort. And the 75,000 is for all of the states to support early on. And he goes on to, the, to say, the Secretary of War, I'm, I'm going to read a lot of this. Some of my following slides, I have names of, of veterans, and it's a little small, so I'm going to you know, read all of this, because I know you'd, you'd have trouble probably. You would, have, you would have trouble seeing it, but I'll do that. Um, the Secretary of War accompanying the President's request called for one regiment of infantry of 780 men from Vermont. This was what Vermont was going to, to offer in the early stages. The Vermont Governor Erastus Fairbanks of St. Johnsbury calls for one regiment for immediate service. Here's a picture of the Governor of Vermont at that time. He was the, the first wartime governor of Vermont. And Vermont will go on to field 17 regiments of infantry by war end under, th under three wartime governors. The first regiment uh, was organized to support men for the war effort. And it comprised of militia companies from Brad Bradford, Brandon, Burlington, Cavendish, Middlebury, Northfield, Rutland, St. Albans, uh, Swanton, and Woodstock. These militia companies were, had basically the militias were organized pretty much right after the Revolutionary War at the state's levels to field men in case there was a national emergency. They were uh, paid to be in these militia companies. They were given basically a uh, dollar a meeting. They required three meetings a year, so they would make three dollars a year to do this. But they were organized, and they were armed and clothed with uniforms at that time. So, <clears throat> excuse me. The first regiment was pulled together relatively quickly because the militia they had a standing militia in Vermont, and it was not only Vermont; it was the other states also. Uh, they were ordered to report uh, to Adjutant General at Rutland by the 3rd of May, 1861, going into camp on the Rutland Fairgrounds, which was called at that time Camp Fairbanks after their, 
their governor. The regiment left Rutland in a train of 20 cars, 20 railroad cars, at 9 in the morning on the 9th of May, 1861, wearing gray uniforms and an evergreen sprig in their caps. One of the issues with the first two regiments being organized or, or joining the war effort is their uniforms were gray. This was a bit of a problem after, after the very beginning of the war. As you could probably well imagine, One of the things I wanted to do at, at this slide here is, uh, no, let me, let me do that after the fact, excuse me for, the, for this. Um, this is the, these slides with the names are, are, are small. There was, as my re refer, research gave me, I came up with 127 names of men that offered their residence as Bristol, Vermont, when they signed up. So Bristol had credit of 127 names uh, to join the war effort. Some of these names, if any of them, and I'll read them to you, but if any of these names uh, perhaps ring a bell name-wise, maybe being a, a a ancestor, a family name, or whatever, I could perhaps get you a little bit more information than what I'm, what I'm going to give you here as to the regimental histories during the Civil War. But uh, the first Vermont regiment was three months, three months enlistment. When that three months was over, these men were done. And actually, the, it went to about four months. But at that time, they were basically done. Many of them signed up again. Many of them did not. They did not see a lot of action. They were basically in the uh, Newport News area of Virginia when they went down, uh, when they arrived in, in, uh, in Virginia. The original uh, man, the, the number of men that uh, that in this regiment was 781 officers and men, and there were a total of six from Bristol. And these names are <clears throat> Orville Gould, and this, this also lists the date of muster. The date of muster was when they actually got together and became a, a unit um, during the Civil War. Their sign-up date <clears throat> may have been something previous to this. It may have been a week, couple weeks, could be a month. But the muster date of, on this they're all the same, of the 9th of May in 1861, uh, all of the, these men signed up for a first regiment. And just to show you this, this first number is a first regiment, the next letter is a company, uh, a company they joined. Just a bit of information, up here where it says Greenwood death date, that those are people that are buried at the Greenwood Cemetery. And the date listed is when they died, when they, when they were buried, basically, in Greenwood. There's a lot of names. Uh, I'm not sure where a lot of these men ended up their life. Uh, these men here, all of the men mustered out of service on August 15, 1861. As I said, some signed up again to join other regiments. Some went home. But the names, just to read them off here quickly, because I know it's hard to say, uh, Orville Gould of Bristol, Amos Leland from Bristol, John McBar from Bristol, Charles Meyer from Bristol, Lucius Ark <coughs> from Bristol, and Benjamin Sheldon of Bristol. And these men went in, and they were basically, when they were done with service, some went on to join other regiments. The second Vermont Regiment was organized in Burlington. Uh, first three years, uh, the first three-year regiment raised in Vermont. These men, when they signed up, they were required to, their duty was for three years. Uh, they left 
Burlington, again, wearing gray. Another issue with the 2nd Regiment wearing gray colors going into the South to fight the battle. Uh, they left for Washington on June 24, 1861, where they arrived on June 26, two days later. Many of these men came out of Vermont taking railroad train down to the coast, sometimes in, uh, in southern Connecticut, then getting on ships. And then the, the ships would go to Washington, D.C. Then it was called Washington City. It wasn't called D.C. But that's where they would end up. They went into camp on Capitol Hill, which is three quarters of a mile east of the present U.S. Capitol. It was close. They could probably see the Capitol from where they were, but it was called Capitol Hill. Um, and the second Vermont Regiment fought in the uh, first major battle of the war, which was Bull Run, or in Manassas, Virginia. The, the, northern, the Northerners, uh, as they were naming the battles, tended to be uh, landmarks or rivers or streams or whatever, and the Confederates tended to name them after a city name they were closest to, but it's the same. Bull Run, the Battle of Bull Run, or Manassas, Virginia, is the same battle. The Second Vermont arrived on the field late in the day, did not see a lot of action, so there were not a lot of injuries because of that. And I, the next slide gives them the name of the men in the Second Vermont. Now, one of the things I've done here, and let me show you this because it sticks up right away in yellow. Yellow indicates that these men were wounded. On the next few slides, you'll start to see some slides where the men's names are in red. They died uh, during, uh, during their time there in Virginia. Some were certainly uh, killed in action, but a greater percentage died of disease while they were in there. These two names here is an Oliver Drake of Bristol. He was in the 2nd Regiment, <coughs> Company K. Private, he was discharged April 19, 1863 for wounds uh, received September 17, 1862. September 17 was the Battle of Antietam in Sharpsburg, Maryland. So what this tells us is Oliver Drake was wounded at Battle of Antietam in Maryland. Now, he did survive. With, with, uh, with the wounding. The next man on the list, uh, J. Walter Hilton, also of Bristol, 2nd uh, Regiment, Company G. He was a corporal. He re-enlisted on January 20th, 1864. He was promoted sergeant, wounded May 3rd, 1863, which was at Marie's Heights in Virginia. He was wounded. Uh, he was reduced. That term means that he, as a corporal, he was probably reduced back to private. I don't know why, but there's a number of, of people that had their, their rank reduced or lowered. So he was promoted sergeant, wounded, uh, reduced uh, in 1864. He was taken prisoner May 21st, 1861, and paroled on uh, November 19, 1864. Paroling was a process, that, process they used during the Civil War where they would exchange their prisoners. They would, uh, if a, uh, a Union man was in a Confederate prison and there was a, a Southern man in a Northern prison, they would exchange them. This was fairly common during the very beginning of the war. They were having a lot of trouble learning what to do with these numbers of prisoners that they did accumulate. So a paroling process was fairly common and he was paroled, and ultimately he went out, he went on and was mustered out in July 26, 1865, which was the end of the war. So he also survived the war, but he was wounded also. Uh, on this one, I need some lights. What I'm going to do real quickly is, as we mentioned, these two, first two regiments were wearing gray. There was, and I can turn this off here in a second, but I just wanted to show you what I had up front here. The uniform did become standardized, as it had to be, because there was so much confusion, especially at Bull Run in Manassas, Virginia, with northern troops that were wearing gray <clears throat> and the southern troops 
wearing, many of them were wearing gray, some were wearing a light brownish uniform also, but many of them were wearing gray. They did go on, the Union went on as, and had a standardized uniform that was basically a blue, a blue coat, blue colored coat, and a lighter blue trousers. And the hat was the same color. It went right along with that. Uh, this is just a, a shirt <clears throat> that was worn, which is a, a handmade shirt that is a combination wool and cotton weave on it. So it's a funny material. After the end of this, you could come up and if you wanted to see what that was all about. But, and this coat here has blue chevrons on it. The blue indicates that this was an infantry corporal's uniform. And once we lower the lights, I will show you this again. Again, these, the chevrons were light blue. The piping on the sleeves, light blue. This was, this was an entry, infantry uniform. Okay. The standardized uniform, as you can sort of see the colors, even though the colors are a little off here, but this here is an infantry colors. The red color was an indication that he was artillery. They had different color coatings so you could identify the soldiers. Red, again, was artillery. And if you go over here to yellow, he was a cavalry soldier. And so they had these different color codes. This was part of the standardization with the dark blue, light blue trousers, but also the piping and the, uh, the chevron colors. Uh, this man wearing red, there's going to be another slide here in advance a little bit. Remember that red is artillery. Now, I think we're skipping to fourth, but again, this talk is only about Bristol soldiers. And this was the next regiment that they started filling up. And a lot of times because they miss one of the regiments because it might have been off in another part of the state. And the Bristol, when the Bristol young men signed up, they were typically signing up cl closer to Bristol and Addison County. The 5th Vermont Regiment was also a three years regiment. Uh, it was organized in the following towns. Company A was in St. Albans, Company B was in Middlebury, Company C, Swanton, Company D, Hyde Park, Company E, Manchester, Company F, Cornwall, Company G, Rutland, Company H, Brandon, Company I, detachments from Burlington, Pulteney, and Timoth, and Company K was from Richmond. And uh, this regiment was mustered into U.S. service for three years at St. Albans, Vermont, and September 16th, 1861, and a few days headed to Washington and camped on Meridian Hill. Meridian Hill is in Washington, D.C., and it's about five miles north of Capitol Hill. So they were amassing in numbers in the Washington area, and they were camping wherever they could find a spot. Uh, and that's where the numbers were. Now, the 5th Regiment, the 5th Vermont Volunteer Regiment, had a, a number of people in them. I mean, large numbers of people. Now we're starting to see the yellow coating again is wounded. The red list people that died. And this is a first slide, there's a second slide. So there was a lot of men from Bristol in the 5th Vermont Regiment. And let me go through this. <clears throat> and it starts off with Edwin Bancroft, Bristol, private, uh, re-enlisted December 15, 1863, promoted to corporal, wounded May 5th, 1864. May 5th was a battle of the wilderness in Virginia. So you can tell that he, he was wounded there, but he was mustered out of service. He survived the war on June 29, 1865. The next two men were Charles Barnett, Bartlett and Henry uh, Beckwith. Uh, both, let's say, the, Charles Bartlett was a sergeant. He was discharged May 26 for disabilities. One of the things I had a little bit of trouble with was a number of men were discharged, some early and some not early. 
for disabilities, but I, all I could really find was it was at the convenience of the government. They were unable to do their full responsibilities as a soldier, uh, so they did let them go. It's interesting to note that some of these men that were, were let go went home and whatever were some of their issues, especially some of the men that were wounded, they came back and they signed up with sometimes the same regiment or another regiment, another Vermont regiment, and went off to, to fight again. Uh, there were an, actually a number of people, I think there was a, at least six to eight people I found that came back to fight again. They really had a, the belief in, the, in this fight that the Union was into to, to preserve the Union. Um, Henry Beckwith uh, was discharged with disabilities. Again, Charles Bowers, private, wounded May 5th. Again, that's the Battle of the Wilderness in Virginia. He was mustered out in the late 1865. Uh, Henry Bowers, Bristol 5th, uh, he re-enlisted December 15th, 1863, promoted to corporal, and died May 16th of wounds received May 5th, Battle of the Wilderness in Virginia. He died from those wounds. Uh, Henry Brooks, Bristol, private wounded, taken prisoner May 29th. He was paroled, exchanged. Uh, 1862, 1862, discharged October 14th. 1862 for wounds. Uh, he was wounded May, cut that off a little bit. I think it was also uh, the Battle of the Wilderness. And he was mustered out in 1865, so he did survive. Warren Brooks, uh, private, died July 25th uh, of disease. Again, there were a greater number of people that died of disease than, than were wounded, wounded or killed in action, wounded and later died. Uh, Napoleon Bush, Bristol, private, discharged six, uh, 1863 for wounds received. Uh, February, you'll see, and he, he was uh, re-signed, he signed up again to the uh, 8th Regiment, Company A, and mustered out at the end of the war. Uh, Eugene Chilson, Bristol, uh, private, re-enlisted, mustered out, uh, so he survived the war. Hiram Cook, also, all these names are Bristol, I don't have to say that. Private, uh, re-enlisted December 15, 1863, promoted sergeant, then first sergeant, then first lieutenant, Company C, November 10, 1864, wounded May 5th, Battle of the Wilderness. And he, at that time, he became captain, he was promoted to captain April 5th, and mustered out of service, service in 1865. Again, all of these dates up here under Greenwood are buried in the cemetery at Greenwood, just for your own reference. Uh, Franklin, uh, Franklin Daniels, uh, private, killed in action May 5th, 1864, Battle of the Wilderness. So uh, the 5th Vermont was very heavily involved in the Battle of the Wilderness in Virginia. Excuse me, Mike. Yes. If you don't mind, maybe we could mention that the 1st Vermont Brigade had held the Brock, Road, or the Brock Cross Road at the Wilderness to keep the Army of the Potomac from being cut in half by uh, Lee's army and lost half of the 2,000 troops that were part of the brigade in uh, those two days. There were 1,000 killed and wounded. There were 50% casualties uh, decimating the brigade and then they brought in the 11th Vermont, which were the 1st Vermont Heavy Artillery, which one regiment was bigger than the whole five, or you know, five regiments that were part of the brigade at that point. So you'll see May 5th many times, unfortunately. Right, There's the, the that, that date does, does show up a great deal for the 5th. Yeah, yeah any, you know, and, and speak up if you have some more information because there's a lot of this that I know you have a lot of information on. So that that's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, he was killed. Like, and Evelyn Foster, private discharged uh, for disabilities again. Charles Grimes, uh, private re-enlisted uh, December 15th, wounded June 29th, 1862. 
and May 4th, 1863, uh, he was wounded twice, twice, and the first date, June 29th, was at Savage Station, which was in Virginia. The second time he was wounded was May 4th, which was Salem Heights, Virginia. And then if you take this out a little bit, then he was killed in action May 5th, the Battle of the Wilderness. So he was wounded twice, and at the Battle of the Wilderness, he was killed. So he, he saw a great deal of action. Uh, the very last name, uh, Berwick Grinnell, private reenlisted December 15, 63, promoted corporal. He was wounded September 19, 1864, which was in Winchester, Virginia, uh, and mustered out in uh, 1865, so he did survive the war. And again, this list here, this is still the fifth. You know, there was a lot of Bristol young men that were in the fifth regiment, and you can see that by the numbers of these two slides. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm just gonna, well, let me read the names, because I know you can't see them. John Hagen, uh, private, he, uh, discharged for disabilities. Benjamin Hickling, Bristol private, he was a wagoneer, he drove a wagon, mustered out in 1864. Stillman Morgan, corporal discharged for disabilities. George Mullins, private discharged for wounds received May 5th, Battle of the Wilderness. Harvey, Harvey C. Myers, Bristol private discharged December 22nd for wounds received. June 29th, 62, um, which was Savage Station, Virginia. Um, William Needham, uh, private discharge for disabilities. Charles O'Brien, here in Bristol, private, died in 1862 of disease. <coughs> Horace O'Brien, private, discharged for disabilities. Lucius Orcutt, uh, Private re-enlisted December 15, 63, promoted Corporal May 5th, wounded, uh, he was promoted Corporal in 1865, but he was wounded on the same day, a different year in 1864, again the Battle of the Wilderness, mustered out in 1865, he survived. James Shadrick, Bristol, Private, died of disease. The next uh, four men were all wounded, William Shadrick, Bristol Private Wounded, May 5th, Battle of the Wilderness, discharged February 22nd for disabilities, John Shadrach, Shadrach. The names seem to be a little different in the book. They may have been a misspelling. They may have been brothers. I'm not sure. Uh, private Discharge, April 20th, 65, for wounds received, May 5th, Battle of the Wilderness. And uh, let's see, David Thompson, Private Reenlisted, December 15th, promoted corporal, um, wounded May 10th, uh, 64. Battle of the Wilderness, I have in my records, uh, was certainly a more than a one day battle. I have what I was able to come up with the 5th to the 10th. They were fighting the Battle of the Wilderness. And so he was wounded during that time. And it was, he was transferred to the VRC, the Veterans Reserve Corps. This was uh, a grouping of men that could no longer do their duties as a soldier, but could still work for the regiment or a group. And they may have done stuff like uh, hospital orderlies, they may have been cooks, but they could no longer uh, do their duties as a soldier carrying a rifle. That was the VRC, the Veterans Reserve Corps. He was discharged in 65. Noah Thompson, private, wounded and taken prisoner June 29th. He was paroled on July 25th, transferred to the Veterans Reserve Corps, and deserted July 1st, 1865, which was pretty much the end of things, but he deserted. He left. He, no doubt, for, for whatever reason he had, he deserted. Uh, Charles Wagner, uh, Sergeant Discharged for Disabilities, and the last one on the list, Charles E.B. Wheeler, uh, Wheeler, Private, taken prisoner May 4th, paroled May 15th, deserted June 29th. He returned 
February 27th, he deserted again July 23rd, 1864, and returned December 24th, 1864, and was discharged in 1865. Um, this reference material I have doesn't go into any more detail than that but he no doubt had his reasons for leaving and coming back. Maybe he was trying to get home and work in the summer in the fields or something. I don't know. But that was interesting just to see that. And <clears throat> The 5th Vermont Regiment had 986 officers and men. Um, there was a total from Bristol. Five died and 14 were wounded. These again were Bristol boys. <laughs> the 6th Vermont Regiment was also a three-year regiment. On September 16, 1861, in response to an urgent request from the Secretary of War, Governor Erastus Fairbanks issued orders for raising and organizing the 6th Vermont. In less than two weeks, the regiment was raised and ordered to rendezvous at Montpelier. On Saturday, May 19, 1861, only 33 days after the governor's call for volunteers, the regiment was en route to the front. Company A was raised in Addison County and commanded by Captain George Parker, Jr. And I remember this, the man, the first man on the list, a Riley Bird. I remember seeing his, his marker down in Greenwood. Uh, he was a first lieutenant. He was promoted to captain. And he was killed in action, again, May 5th, 1864, Battle of the Wilderness. Moses Dunchy, or Bushy, excuse me. Moses Bushy, private discharged, uh, 1863, uh, for enlistment. He enlisted in the first New York Independent Battery. He, he left and joined to go to New York. Alonzo Danforth, Bristol, private, re-enlist uh, December 15th, 1863, promoted corporal November 1st, wounded May 3rd, 1863. Um, May 3rd was Maurice Heights in Virginia. Um, transferred, after he was wounded, he was transferred to the Veterans Reserve Corps and, and he was mustered out in 1865. The war was, uh, was over, but they were, some of the people were certainly getting mustered out throughout 1865 and actually a few people were there until 1866 when the war was, was certainly over. Um, uh, a George Day private uh, drafted, mustered out 1865. <clears throat> so he basically went in as a draftee and certainly survived the war, was not wounded, and was, was out. Yes, Mandy? I'm wondering, was there at any point at the time where they started to shuffle people? You could see like the impact of this one battle on a small town and the implications. Did they, it seems like putting regiments in with towns or by even states, if you see one big battle, you could eliminate a high population of people from the same area. There, there was certainly a, some of that in the, uh, in the Civil War, and I think it went on actually after the Civil War, where you're talking about like family members that all worked together. Well, I know that later, right? Like they started to make some changes. If there was like a yes. last son that was going to die, they took him out of the war. But it seems like these small towns could get ravaged. If they were, for example, the Battle of the Wilderness, how many people from this area? Were you have to imagine what was happening to all the little towns all over the north, especially Vermont, when they lost so many young people. And young people in the prime of their lives, probably in their early 20s or so, late teens, 20s, you know, 25. And what this did to how it devastated a lot of these little towns. The men didn't come back. And it had to have a great impact, a great impact. It just seems like it would have been a good idea. <laughs> no, I hear, I hear you. Yeah, that's right. I wonder, uh, it's a good point, and that's why in the Union Army, at least, initially they 
uh, put regiments of different states in the same brigade groupings. You'd have three or four regiments uh, in what they called a brigade, and you had three brigades in the division, etc. And Vermont was you, almost unique in requesting that its first five uh, three-month regiments, the second through the sixth that Mike's speaking of here, be brigaded together. And the, the War Department was reluctant to do that for that very reason, <laughs> because uh, of uh, something like that happening. For instance, the federal assaults on the stone wall at Fredericksburg in 62 that wiped out the Irish Brigade and so on from New York State. Um, uh, and you, so anyway, you know, so here at the wilderness where half of the brigade was killed and wounded in one day, or two days actually, um, a thousand casualties, that's what happened. I mean, it was spread across all of the towns in Vermont, but there, I think there was a New Jersey Brigade, but it was very but, uh, but Vermont felt special because it had troops uh, in one unit. Uh, but there was, we well, did think about it. the South, however, almost all of their brigades, you know, there were four regiments from Alabama, you know, four from Virginia, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it was thought about. Mm -hmm. Did that somewhat answer your question? Yeah. Uh, let me say here, uh, do the last one in George Day here. Um, Warner, Warner Dunshee was, I think, well known after the war here, here in Bristol, the Dunshee block, just not too far from where we're, where we're standing, uh, and his brother also. But uh, he was a corporal, uh, promoted to sergeant June 28, 1862, discharged for wounds received April 16th, 62. April 16th, 62 was Lee's Mill in Virginia. So he was wounded there. Um, again, uh, Warner Dunshee is, is, buried, is buried in the cemetery here in Greenwood. John Mc, McBar, this particular name, he was in the first Vermont. He, his name was there. He's also in the sixth Vermont. So he was promoted to first sergeant pr primarily because he had he had experience w as a as an army soldier and he was promoted early on. Uh, while we're talking about uh, promoted, so many of the leader leaders it was fairly common in the Vermont regiments, and a lot of times it was who formed these regiments. Regiments were about a thousand men. The leaders were actually voted in. The uh, the colonel, the captain, the uh, sergeants, the lieutenants, they were voted in. Many of these men didn't have a lot of experience other than perhaps they were voted in because they were well liked, they may perhaps did, did well with people, with groups of people. There were a few instances where some of the people that were voted in uh, had actually had experience. They graduated from Norwich University, which was certainly uh, I think from the early 1800s, Norwich has been a school here in Vermont. Uh, but some of the people had experience and some didn't. They did kind of the best they could. Uh, this man was promoted to first sergeant, uh, discharged eight, uh, October 31st of wounds received, again, April 16th, Lee's Mills in Virginia. Uh, let's see, uh, James or John Moody, private discharge May 30th for disabilities. Daniel Monroe, uh, private mustered out in 1865. Henry Noland, private died April 25th, 1862 of disease. He's interred at the National, uh, National Cemetery in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So there's, there's certainly some, uh, some Vermont soldiers that are interred in some of the national cemeteries around the country. Uh, Joseph Oakes, private, died April 25th of wounds received April 16th, again, uh, Lee's Mill in Virginia, and he's interred at the National Cemetery in Yorktown, Virginia.
And the remaining names here for the six uh, were Henry, Henry Prime, uh, Sergeant died June 26th of disease. Daniel Quim, Quimby, uh, private, he was a musician. Discharged for disabilities, Ira Quimby. Uh, private, re-enlisted, 1863, promoted to corporal. And then he was promoted to sergeant and mustered out in 1865 at the end of the war. Charles Randall, uh, private, promoted quartermaster sergeant. April 25th, 18, 1862, promoted to second lieutenant, November 1st, 1862, promoted to first lieutenant, May 15th, and he was mustered out in 1865. So, John Scarborough, uh, private, wounded, and taken prisoner June 29th, 1862, and died of wounds on uh, July 7th, 1862. So he, he, you know, he, he was another boy that died. Richard Charlow of Bristol Private, he died of disease. Nelson Tart, Private, re-enlisted December 15, 1863, promoted to corporal, reduced, meaning he probably lost his corporal stripes and went back to private, uh, and mustered out in June 26, 1865. And Edson Tart, I'm assuming they're probably brothers, you know. They signed up together, uh, same day, same name. Uh, private, he's transferred to the Veterans Reserve Corps in 1864 and discharged <coughs> October 15th. Edwin Vradenberg, uh, private, he died of disease. Edwin Wright, Private died June 1st of wounds received April 16th. Again, the battle at Lee's Mill in Virginia. The 7th Vermont, which was another three years regiment. The 7th Vermont Regiment numbering 943 officers and men were mustered into service of the United States at Rutland on February 12, 1862. On March 10th, the 7th left Rutland for New York City for further transportation aboard two sailing ships to the Mississippi, Louisiana area, where most of the regiments at, up to this time had certainly been going on, going into the Washington area. They left for a dis different destination. A portion of the 7th occupied Fort Pike. It's at the entrance to Lake Pontchartrain in, uh, in New Orleans uh, for a time. And of the 7th, Joseph Bacon, private re-enlisted, February 15th, discharged uh, in 1865 for disabilities. George Bunker, promoted corporal, mustered out in 1866. Abram Butler, private, died uh, July 4th of accidental wounds, interred at the Chalmette National Cemetery near, near New Orleans. It didn't go into exact details of how they died of accidental wounds. I, I really don't know. Craig, unless you have some information on, on any of, you know, accidental woundings, was it gunshots or something? I don't know. No. I really don't know. Um, <clears throat> Charles Duchon promoted, uh, oh no, private, excuse me. Private lost on the steamship North America, December 22nd, 1864. Um, the, he was on a, on a steamship on his way from New Orleans to New York City. Uh, and as they were coming around Key West and coming up the east coast of Florida and got off of the coast of, of Georgia, the, the steamship they were on started taking on water and sank. And there were 194 lives lost, 20 saved. Um, 
in the seventh, there were seven from Bristol and and uh, the seven men from Bristol and two died. Again, the he who died probably drowning on a steamship off the coast of Georgia on his way to New York City. Um, Alfred, <coughs> Alfred Gauthier, uh, private promoted uh, principal musician, June 1st, reduced, meaning he was, re, uh, he, he lost, you know, that, that rank uh, and mustered out in 1865. John Hines, private, mustered out in 1864. Horace Robbins, Private re-enlisted 18, uh, 1864 and mustered out in 1866. I don't know if any of you are picking up on names that could be family names, you know, gene related to genealogy. If so, at the end you could let me know. Perhaps we could get you more information. Because Martha, wasn't there some uh, Robbins? Mm -hmm. In our, our genealogy, yeah, it may have been may have been the, this person. I don't know. The Ninth Vermont Regiment, another three-year regiment, in the spring of 1862, recru recru recruiting <laughs> ceased in Vermont uh, due to the feeling that enough troops were in the field to end, to end the war. On May 22, 1862, Governor Holbrook who was the governor of the state at this time, there's a picture of him, received a telegraphic order from the War Department to raise at once another regiment of infantry in the shortest time possible. In six weeks, the 9th Regiment was fully organized and in camp in Brattleboro. The 9th Regiment was mustered into service of the United States July 9th, 1862 for three years with 929 officers and men. A typical regiment was, round numbers was 1,000 men. A typical company was a, about 100 people. So there were 10 companies to a regiment, which was typical. But the numbers didn't always work out quite that way. Um, <clears throat> in the ninth, uh, looks like the majority of the people um, went home. Uh, there were two men, and I'm going to just try to speed this up just a little bit. I'll, I'll read the, the men that, the two men that died here that are in red. Francis Dwyer, D-W-Y-E-R, private, died in 1865 of disease. And a Frank Strait, a private, uh, died of disease and interned in the National Cemetery in Hampton, Virginia. Do you, any of the rest of you want me to read some of these names or we're, we're kind of okay or I know you can't see them that much but you're okay? <laughs> you can see them. Read them? Yeah, you can actually read them. Okay, okay. Uh, Thomas, again, all of these people are from Bristol. Thomas Ash, private, transferred to Company B, mustered out in 1865. Erastus Chase, um, private discharge May 25th for disabilities uh, and then he went on let's say the second battery of light infantry transferred to the first company heavy artillery uh, so he, he moved around a bit uh, Joseph Clapper private transferred to company A promoted to corporal and mustered out in 1865 uh, let's say I covered the two men that, d that died of, uh, of disease. A, a loyal Finch private mustered out at the end of the war. George Green private mustered out at the end of the war. Harvey, or excuse me, Charles Myers uh, corporal reduced, probably back to private, on June 13, 1865. A William Richardson Private transferred to Company A, uh, mustered out in 1865. And the last name in the list, uh, Lyman Weaver, <coughs> private, mustered out June 13, 1865. Did they ever have to draft, or were people just there? was a draft at one point, and actually there were there were riots in New York City, uh, and I can't quite remember the year, but I think it was 62, 63. 
And that was six, what was it, uh, later in 63, I think. Okay. Uh, Mike, because they sent back the 6th Army Corps to help put down the riots. There were a number of uh, African Americans lynched on the uh, lampposts in the streets of New York City. Mm -hmm. But yeah, some of the some some of the soldiers were sent to New York City to sort of quell the riots that were taking place. But yes, to answer your question, there was certainly a draft. And they were they were rioting because of the draft. They didn't want to draft. A lot of people just didn't didn't want any part of it. You know, I mean, un, not unlike anybody of any any year, really. But there was a large, if I can interject, there was a large immigrant community at that point. You know, a lot of the Irish that had come out of uh, after the famine and so on into New York City especially, and did not want to be fighting someone else's war at that point. Um, so it's not, you know, it's one of those somewhat common issues. Uh, uh, you could, in the Union case, my uh, great-great-whatever grandfather, Alan, who was on the farm in Panton, uh, he was drafted for the Vermont service in 1860, and I forget, uh, at age, you know, you could be drafted up to age 45. Uh, he was close to that age. He paid, you could pay a $300 so-called commutation fee in the Union service, and they would supply, you could get out of the draft, and you could, they would, in theory, buy a substitute to serve for you. That's how all of the uh, you know, wealthier folks in the South, they actually started a draft earlier than the Union side, strangely enough. Southern uh, men stopped enlisting sooner than the Union troops did, or uh, civilians did. A bit later, they uh, came up with the fact that if uh, a uh, person had, what was it, 20 slaves on their pan plantation. One white man could be exempted from the southern draft for every 20 slaves that he had to keep track of. So again, the, uh, the poor southern uh, farmers were fighting the war so that the, uh, you know, both sides, those that were well to do, didn't necessarily have to go into the field. Mm -hmm. But there, there was, there was certainly a draft. There were so many young people fighting the war, especially early on, that wanted to take part. And again, it's not unlike any younger men that want to get into something and, and to do it. Not unlike any of the wars we've had. You know, they did, didn't really have a great deal of time with a uh, problem with getting men to sign up, especially early in the war. A little later on in the war, uh, the ability to make photographs, you know, was out there and some photographs came back to the north showing the, just the terrible, terribleness, terribleness of war, which has always been. And a lot of people were seeing that and some people said, I, you know, I just don't want, I don't want this. I don't want to be any part of it. Uh, so that had some effect probably a little later on in the war, too. Yeah. <clears throat> and we go off to, again, these are just Bristol young men, you know, signing up. We go off to the 11th Vermont <coughs> Regiment, another three-year regiment. And this, they have a very interesting story here. Originally recruited as an infantry regiment in the summer of 1862. The first heavy artillery slash 11th Vermont Volunteers was the largest regiment. Its aggregate membership, officers and men, was 2,320 men. Over 2,000 men were part of this, of this uh, unit. Uh, where typically a typical regiment was around a, a thousand men. Uh, but they, they were assigned to duty in the northern defenses of Washington. It was soon changed from infantry to heavy artillery by the order of the War Department. These men were... Uh, it was interesting, as soon as they became heavy artillery, the Remember I told you the color of the, the chevrons or the stripes on the uniforms were red for artillery. Piping on the uniform was red. And this next line here, 
After the Battle of the Wilderness, General Grant summoned all available troops to the reinforcement of the Army of the Potomac. The 11th fought as infantry with red trimmings on their uniforms, and that's why they're, they're making this statement. They're fighting as infantry, but all the color coding of their stripes says they're, they're artillery people. But they were certainly fighting, fighting that. Of the 11th, um, again, the names we have are Alonzo Baker. Uh, he w discharged for disabilities. We come down, uh, Abraham Besner, uh, private wounded June 1st, 1864, and April 2nd, 1865. <coughs> Let's see, I can give you a little information on, on those dates. Let's see, June 1st uh, was at Cold Harbor, Virginia. It was actually June 1st to the 12th, uh, the battle fight that was fought at Cold Harbor, Virginia. Um, Joseph Besner, again, uh, they signed up the same year, same last name. I'm assuming they're brothers. Uh, private wounded June the 2nd, again, Cold Harbor, uh, 1864 and October 19th, 1864. October 19th, 1864 was at Cedar Creek, the Battle of Cedar Creek in Virginia, which is west of Winchester, Virginia. Uh, both Craig and I have uh, reenacted that battle at, uh, at Cedar Creek. Uh, and he, after that, uh, wounded, he deserted November 22nd, 1865, which was, you know, the war was kind of over. Uh, you could assume that the war was over and he didn't want to be there any longer, he just left. But it was considered desertion because he wasn't officially, officially released. Uh, George Drake, promoted corporal uh, and mustered out in 1865. Richard Monroe, private, mustered out in 1865. Francis Mullings, a private taken prisoner on June 23rd, 1864, uh, receipted for uh, April 21st, 1865, meaning the war was over and he was released from, uh, from prison there. He was wounded and he was taken and, uh, and mustered out in uh, 1865. A Patrick Finney, uh, Bristol private died of disease. A Sedgwick Preston private promoted corporal, transferred to Company A and mustered out August 25th, 1865. Now, <clears throat> we went on to the 14th Vermont Regiment. This was a nine months enlistment. The 14th Regiment was, received, was raised under President Lincoln's call on August 4th, 1862 for 300,000 uh, militia to serve for nine months. A, a call for a great amount of people to serve. Companies were recruited in Addison, Rutland, and Bennington counties. The regiment went into camp in Brattleboro, October 6, 1862, and was mustered into the United States service on October 21st, 1862, and left the next day for Washington, D.C., 952 strong, 952 officers and men in the regiment. <clears throat> the names here are Edwin Barnes, uh, sergeant promoted, uh, first sergeant, uh, July 3rd, 1863, and mustered out at, in 1860, it's even hard for me to see that, 1863. A Royal C. Brown, private, mustered out 1863. This was the end of their enlistment, and you know, it was before the, the war had, had ended. Uh, Henry Butler, private, wagoneer, uh, mustered out 1863. This was the end of their enlistment. Michael Callahan, private, wounded July 3rd, 1863. 
and mustered out at the end of the month. Now you have to be aware that the Battle of Gettysburg was July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd of July 1863. The 14th was right there in the middle of the Battle of Gettysburg. A noble Dunchy, this is the brother to Warren. Uh, he was a captain and he was mustered out in 1863, which was the end of the enlistment, and apparently escaped unscathed. And when I say unscathed, physically unscathed. All these men were, were scarred for the rest of their lives for what they had gone through. Nicholas Gravel, private, discharge April 1st for disabilities. Franklin Grinnell, uh, private, uh, died June uh, 6th of disease. Augustine Manum, private, mustered out 18th, July 30th, the end of July 1863, the end of enlistment. Napoleon McIntyre, Private Mustered Out, July, the end of July, 1863. Michael Mellon, Private Mustered Out, same time, end of July. Stephen Palmer, Private Musician, Mustered Out, the end of July, 63. Damos, Damos Patno, Private Mustered Out, July 30th, end of the month, 1863. Israel Plain, uh, Private Mustered Out, end of July 63. Henry Powers, Corporal Mustered Out, end of July 63. Edward, Edward Tatro, Private Wounded July 3rd, again, Gettysburg. Mustered Out, July 30th, end of his enlistment. Solomon Vredenberg, Private Mustered Out, the end of July 63. Daniel Whittemore, Private Mustered Out, the end of July 63. And a Christopher Yatta, Yatta, I'm not, I'm guessing on that just a little bit, Yatta, Y-A-T-T-A-W, private, wounded July 3rd, mustered out the end of July 63. This again, Battle of Gettysburg. Again, <clears throat> there's so much that could be studied at any of these battles, and I have not attempted to go into this, but the, the Vermont 14th Regiment was really instrumental for uh, control of during Pickett's Charge coming across the field on getting into a position and taking out a lot of Southern troops. After that, <clears throat> the 17th Vermont Regiment, this was the last regiment for Vermont. It was a three-year regiment. The 17th recruiting was authorized by the government July 2nd, 1863 and August 3rd, 1863. Governor Frederick Holbrook directed that it be raised. The intention was to put into the field a regiment of veterans. October 17th, President Lincoln issued a call for 300,000 men to fill up the regiments then in the field. It was at that time that Vermont's Governor J. Gregory Smith came into office. He was the third wartime governor of Vermont. And with his push, energy, and persistency, the 17th Regiment came about. Company H was raised primarily from Addison County for the 17th Vermont Regiment. And there's a picture of President <laughs> Gregory Smith The names here are William Bicknell, uh, promoted corporal uh, December 64, promoted sergeant, and discharged in 1865. Elias Jacobs, private, promoted corporal, reduced uh, in 1865, and then mustered out in 65. Uriah Jacobs, uh, sergeant, died June 22nd, 1864, of wounds received June 17th, 1864. Bear with me just a second here. <clears throat> uh, June 17th, 1864 was in, the, in Petersburg, Virginia. Uh, and he is interred in the National Cemetery in Arlington, Virginia. That's Uriah Jacobs.
Horace May, private promoted corporal, mustered out in 65. Josiah Weaver, corporal, reduced uh, in 64. Wounded April 2nd, 65. This was also the battle in Petersburg. It was about a year later, but they were still fighting in, in Petersburg. Uh, and he was discharged uh, in 65 for wounds. Vermont also, besides their infantry regiments, did have a few artillery regiments. They had the heart heavy artillery, uh, which was the 11th and uh, the 11th Infantry Regiment. And the 2nd Battery Light Infantry, again, there was Bristol Boys here. The 2nd Vermont Battery was organized in Brandon, December 13, 1861. The battery was armed with four six-pounder Sawyer rifled guns and two 20-pounder Parrot rifles. I couldn't find any pictures of any, any Sawyer rifled guns, but this picture here <clears throat> is uh, a Parrot rifle. They tend to have a large reinforcement band over the end of the barrel. They make them in 10-pounder, 20-pounder, uh, and like the one on the green over here is a, considered a 100-pounder. That pound figure represents the approximate weight of the projectile this thing would fire. So a 20 pounder would fire typically something that was close to a 20 pound uh, sh artillery shell. Uh, typically they weren't really a ball type shell, they were more of a, a conical uh, projectile type shell as the cannon on the park never fired a round ball. <clears throat> on the February 6th your birthday. Yes, sir. 1861, the battery embarked on board the ship Idaho at Boston Harbor with the 1st Maine and the 4th Massachusetts batteries and headed to Ship Island, Mississippi. <clears throat> ship Island is located south of Belix excuse me, in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi on the Gulf of Mexico. It's about 16 miles south of the mainland on an island south of Biloxi. <clears throat> Second Battery Light Artillery, Eurastus Chase, uh, transferred to the first company heavy artillery in 65 and mustered out in 65. Charles Clapper, some of these names we've seen earlier. Uh, Private transferred to first company heavy artillery, mustered out in 65. Uh, Jesse Hastings, Corporal, died of disease. Amos Leland, Sergeant, reduced in 62, he died of disease. Napoleon McIntyre, Private, promoted Corporal, mustered out in 65. Lauren Walker, Private, mustered out July 31st, 1865. Edmund, uh, excuse me, Edward Whittemore, Private, mustered out, 65. George Whittemore, uh, I think they're brothers, private, mustered out in 1865. Vermont also had a cavalry regiment. Uh, first Vermont, I think there was one, there may have been more, but I, I know of one anyway. Okay. This regiment was recruited by Colonel Lemuel Platt, who had been specifically commissioned by the Secretary of War for the purpose and was the first full regiment of cavalry uh, raised in New England, the first Vermont. Company F was raised from Wyndham County, Company K was raised from Addison County. In 42 days from the time Colonel Platt received his authority, the regiment went into camp in Burlington uniformed and mounted. Mounted meaning they had their horses at that time. They were ready to go. The regiment was mustered in the service of the United States November 19th, 1861 and started for Washington on the 14th of the next month. You could mention, Mike, that they were all mounted on Morgan horses. That's, that's very interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Tried to have match colors. Right, right. The 1st Vermont of, of 
the first uh, Vermont Cavalry. Uh, David Hamblin, uh, he was taken prisoner March 1st. He was paroled on November 19th, meaning he was, he was in prison for some time. Uh, and he was mustered out in 65. James Lee, private discharged 1862 for wounds received August 2nd of 1862. August 2nd, 62, was the battle at Orange Courthouse in Virginia. Uh, <clears throat> and Benjamin Sheldon, uh, sergeant promoted uh, company commissary sergeant, wounded March 1st, 64, must, and went out in 64. March 1st was in the Battle of Mechanics, Mechanicsville in Virginia. This is an interesting one. A lot of people don't know this. That there was a, a thing called the Frontier Cavalry. The frontier, frontier Cavalry was born of a frontier or a border fear uh, created by the St. Albans Raid in October 1864. Because the raiders came out of Canada and came into St. Albans, after this had, was over, they put a, a, a number of men on horseback up there to watch the border. New York State did the same thing. They had a frontier cavalry. But this is the one. And the St. Albans raid was towards the end of the war. Two, of her, <clears throat> two Vermont companies were organized at Burlington by General Washburn early in January of 1865. They moved to St. Albans when new barracks had been built. I, have, I found that there were three men from Bristol that were on the, the frontier cavalry. Uh, William Orcutt, and he, these men didn't see any, any, uh, any battle or they didn't see anything on the border from that point on. But they were mustered out in, 60, in 1865. A Russell Orcutt uh, private mustered out, same time. All these men were mustered, mustered out the end of June 1865. And a George Wright private mustered out in 1865. Vermont volunteers in the 54th Massachusetts Regiment. Any of Vermont's citizens that were, were black, had to, they went to Massachusetts to sign up to fight in the war. And Bristol had, I think on the next slide, it shows that there's um, four, five, six people from Bristol that were black that went down to the 54th, uh, went to Massachusetts to sign up. Um, they were organized in Reedsville, Massachusetts, training at Camp Meigs, and they mustered into service May 13, 1863. They left Boston on the steamer Demolay for Hilton Head, South Carolina on May 28, 1863, arriving there on the June 3, 1863. A total of 69 black Vermonters were members of the 54th Massachusetts Infantry. And the, the title in the day was Colored Troops. Um, there were eight, excuse me here, there were five men from Bristol in the 54th Massachusetts. By the way, um, there was a movie that, came, that was made in uh, 1989 starring Matthew Broderick, uh, Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman, and, it was, it, and the movie's name was Glory. And it was a, a fairly, fairly accurate uh, movie about the 54th Massachusetts in South Carolina. And it was based on the history of the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment. Uh, The names from Bristol, Silas Crozier, 
uh, private. He was drafted and mustered out in 1865. Charles Nelson, uh, private, killed in action February 20th, 1864. That particular battle that he was killed at was called was the Battle of Olusti. It was in Florida. And it was February 20th, 1864, in North Florida, about 25 miles west of Jacksonville, Florida. And he was killed there. It was interesting that where I read that the Confederates said that if any black troops came into a battle, they would be they would be killed immediately if they were ever captured. So I don't know if he died of wounds or the Confederates uh, shot him. You know, after the battle, I really don't know. But it, the that also went out to all the white officers that were leading these black regiments or this black regiment in particular that they would be killed immediately if they caught them. But one, one of the men from Bristol was killed in Florida at a battle. Uh, and Amasa Peters was pri a private. He was mustered out in 65. Charles Prince, you may recognize that name, You're Prince. Father. Yeah, I think his name was, was Arthur. Dude, Arthur, yeah. Arthur. Yes. this dude was his son. Um, and he used to, I think, drive this, this coach that's out front from the railroad station to the Bristol House. Right. Yeah. And so you've probably heard the name Prince. Also, when you go drive into Rite Aid, that's Prince Lane. Right. And that is coming back to, I, I don't know if it's his father, Charles, or Arthur, which was nicknamed Dude, Prince. But uh, Charles Prince certainly survived the war. He was mustered down in 65. Mark Roberts, uh, private discharged in 65 for disabilities. These were the five men from Bristol. <coughs> there were also Vermont soldiers in other states' regiments. I have a three-month-old. This is fascinating. I, 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 I understand. <laughs> I, I understand. <clears throat> and I don't know that quite the situation if these 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 men were happened to be other places. And again, the question was, where's your place of residence? And all these men said Bristol, Vermont. Uh, there's an Oscar Grandel. Uh, with, he was with the 45th Massachusetts Infantry, and they fought in the North Carolina area. Uh, by the way, all of, these, all of these men are buried here in Greenwood, every one of them. Uh, a Cornelius uh, Ganey, G-A-N-E-Y, he was with the 28th Massachusetts Infantry. They were primarily Irish Americans. And this, this first name here, I don't know if I can pronounce it, it's H-O-D-I-J-A-H. Hodaha or Hoda, Hodaja, Lincoln was his last name, from Bristol. He was with the 3rd Massachusetts Cavalry. Uh, he was sent into the Louisiana area. And Edward uh, Patno, uh, the 193rd New York Infantry, uh, served, with, served in the closing months of the war. Uh, Thomas Perdon, P-U-R-D-O-N, served in Virginia and Maryland. W.S. Sherwin with the 98th New York Infantry served in the Virginia area. John Thomas Tatro with the 10th New York Infantry known as McChesney Zoavs. Russell Wales uh, with the 5th New York Cavalry and he served in the Virginia and the Maryland area. So they were uh, Bristol boys off in other regiments of other states also. <clears throat> We're getting close to the end. Um, the final report. General Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia was on the morning of April 9th, 1865. President Lincoln was shot at Ford's Theater and died 722 the next morning, April 15th. The war was over when Lincoln was shot and killed. At least it was over with Robert E. Lee's troops. There was still some fighting 
I think, further west. But primarily, the major portion was over at that point. President Jefferson Davis was captured on the morning of May 10th uh, in Irwin's, Irwinville in Georgia. The last fighting of Vermont troops was done by the 7th Vermont Regiment at Whistler, Alabama, April 13, 1865. Over, 30, <clears throat> over 34,000 Vermont men fought for the Union. Vermont having a population of about 300,000 citizens at that time. Vermonters suffered, suffered a total of 1,852 men killed or mortally wounded. Another 3,362 died of disease, died in prison, or from other causes. For a total of 5,194 men, one of the highest per capita of any northern state. This, this is my reference material that I used to go through these names and come up with the information I have. Um, all of these books seem to be printed in the 1886, 1886 or 66, and 1892. This first book was a, a listing of about 34,000 names. And it was originally called the, uh, the Revised Roster of Vermont Volunteers. The man that put it together, Theodore Peck, uh, was the adju adjutant general at that time. It is also known as Peck's Roster because he put it together, sometimes more familiar, you know, more familiar with the name Peck's Roster. It's a, it's a book that's 863 pages long. There's also a two-volume set of the Vermont in the Civil War, a history of Vermont Soldiers and Sailors, A War for the Union. Uh, this is a, volume one was 620 pages, volume two was 808 pages, total of 1,428 pages. It would typically list uh, regiments <clears throat> and it would tell stories of where the regiment was. They put all this together certainly after the war and what was going on by members of the various regiments, regiments and companies. The last book over here is dated 1886, The History of Addison County. This is where I picked up an in initial number of names for soldiers uh, from Addison County. And then I had to narrow it down through uh, for soldiers from Bristol. There was a fair amount of reference you know, that I had to do sorting through many thousands of names just to come down with this 127 names from Bristol that were fighting uh, with their residents listed as Bristol itself. These books <clears throat> are, are very available. They're available on the internet. So you can go and, and read these books. And these books are quite old. But uh, just a, a wealth of information, yes. We could mention uh, Peck's roster is available at the Bristol Library. Yes. Don't forget about Benedict. Peck's roster <clears throat> is, the original version is at the library. I happen to have a reprinted, we could probably throw the lights on. I have a reprinted version, and this is Peck's roster. And typically what it lists is by companies and lists by names, and it just lists everybody that fought in the Civil War from the state of Vermont. There's a lot of information in this book. But <clears throat> it's a reprinted one, so I don't mind turning the pages on this thing. I have copies of the original books, but they're a lot more fragile since they're, you know, they're so old anymore. Um, <clears throat> that's the bulk of my talk. I had a couple of other things I didn't get to. <clears throat> I was going to talk about uh, the U.S. flag at that time, stars, the, the Confederate national flag at that time, and the states that, uh, you know, that the southern states that started the war in Charleston Harbor. But there's been a lot of information coming up. <laughs> I'm surprised that you, many of you didn't follow me. <laughs> but <clears throat> that's my presentation. If, if there's any questions, uh, hopefully I can answer it. Uh, Craig sitting in the back uh, is a fellow 
Civil War reenactor. I did that for about 10 years. And these are uh, uniforms. These are clothing I wore. Uh, this is not original clothing. The wool wouldn't have lasted that long. It would have been moth-eaten by this time. <clears throat> but they're very authentically reproduced. And uh, it's all wool material as the originals. But they're just as warm. And, and very warm. But the only thing I did find out, wool can be warm. <clears throat> but when I was doing reenactments in Pennsylvania and Virginia, <clears throat> It tends to wick moisture away from you very nicely. Not to say you're any cooler, but it, it takes it. Wool, wool is a nice fabric. It really is. It really is. Yes? We might mention also if anyone does have Civil War uh, uh, ancestors that are part of the 34,000 or whatever, you can request information from the National Archives. And especially for the Union, they, uh, there was a mass effort after the war. All of the company orderly logs and so on are off there and have been uh, cataloged and so on. Uh, it used to be very inexpensive to get those, but you can get photocopies and see sometimes where your ancestor was on the pay records you know, every month or whatever. The southern records, a lot of those were destroyed, but there's a massive, there's a lot of information there that you can, or if they ended up in the hospital or whatever, you can find out. Where that information is available because <clears throat> Martha has, a, has an ancestor that died in the Washington, D.C. area. He, he died in the hospital. Yeah. Not as cheap now. You can still get it. Thank you. This is a it's a great experience to do research on something like this because I learn a lot too. You know, when you start going through all this information, uh, you know, you find out that these men, <clears throat> these young men, were not a whole lot different than you and I. They were, you know. They saw something they wanted to be part of, and I read accounts that some of these young men were so tired of looking at the backside of a mule as they were plowing their fields, they wanted to do something different. So they wanted to sign up. Most people believed that the War of the Rebellion, the Civil War, wouldn't last very long. Most, especially the most Northerners, figured they'd go right down, send the, you know, the, uh, the Southern boys home, and it'd be done with. Well, that's not the way it worked. But a lot of people just wanted to be part of it before it was over. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.